Hi, I'm Maddie Sloan and welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. We have a very special episode for you today and if you love mountains, stay tuned. Darren Leal crosses over the border into Chile to discover Patagonia from a different perspective and he gives the Lumix S1R a field test in Western Australia. But first, Tony Hewitt is an internationally renowned photographer who boasts a wide genre of work, but is best known for his stunning aerial landscapes. Peter Eastway and Tony run an annual workshop on the South Island of New Zealand. Let's go there now. So, Tony, what are we doing here? 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 This is Middlehurst. Middlehurst, what is Middlehurst? Well, the Middlehurst experience is an immersive experience for photographers who want to step it out and step it up and try something really amazing. So where exactly is Middlehurst in the world? Middlehurst is at the top end of the South Island of New Zealand, up the Awatara Valley. What is it all about? I mean, why should they come to the Middlehurst experience? Well, I think what the beauty of the Middlehurst photography experience is it's immersive. The minute you step out, you're in this incredible environment where you can shoot everything from a macro of ice right through to these magnificent mountain ranges or the beautiful braided rivers. We include aerial photography, we drive down the riverbeds in trucks and four-wheel drives, etc. And you can basically discover what it is about landscape photography that you love. You've been in almost every area of professional photography. How do you describe the genre you're working in today? I think fine art aerial is the area that people know me best for now. Fine art landscape, but specifically fine art aerial, it's something I found a niche in. I've had six solo exhibitions in that area and a couple of major projects, so yeah. So where does the passion come from? I mean, sometimes, you know, taking photos day in, day out, you, you still hammer it, you still love it. I do, and I think it's because I've kept changing and evolving, and for me it's about finding perfection amongst chaos or finding order amongst chaos. So whether it was back in the early days of wedding, shooting portraits with chaotic shoots, but getting something just right. And then now in, in landscape and particularly fine art aerial, looking for some simplicity amongst what can be a chaotic landscape before you. So it's quite different to weddings, I would imagine, being out here in the landscape. It is, you know, and I suppose that's one of the blessings that I've felt I've had in my career is that I've shot photographs where it's people, weddings, portraits, but I've also had the opportunity to get out in these places where it's pretty much a solo pursuit. Often I'm working with other photographers, but each person's in their own little zone and just sharing a few ideas here and there. But I do enjoy the peace and quiet and the solitude that you can get from this type of photography. I guess it's fair to say these days you're well known for the aerials. Where did that start? There's something about looking down on things that I resonate with. I'm not as instinctive with the depth of landscape, so that standing on a hill, looking across a valley, looking at depth of field, do I bring this into focus, do I leave it out of focus? Some part of me just likes the idea of looking down and seeing patterns and shapes. I think it's shape pattern, texture and form that really grab my attention. And who knows why we like certain things. Some people like macro, you know, that's just the who I am. So your exhibition work, you do quite a few exhibitions around Perth, you've exhibited for a number of years. They do certainly concentrate on the aerial, don't they? Yeah, particularly coastal. Uh, the last six exhibitions have all been to do with water, sand, and one of the catch lines in the last couple of exhibitions, which I identified after the first few, was that I am a witness to the dance between the water and the light. And every time I say that to myself, it's like, yeah, that's, that's what I like to do. I just get mesmerised by watching the light and the water and the shapes all work together. Apart from photography, I happen to know you don't mind standing up in front of a crowd and talking and, and teaching. What's yeah, that I, side? Would you like the three hour lecture or would you like the short one? <laughs> no, I look, look, I've been speaking for over 20 years now. And one of the things I get the biggest kick out of is watching people have an aha moment. So whether it's on a stage with a thousand people and you're delivering a keynote and you just drop a few ideas on people and you see them start and go, I get it, yes I get it. Or whether it's one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which I do a lot of, or coaching, and even one-on-one -on -one aerial, hiring a plane, hiring a pilot and taking somebody up and saying, let's just focus on what it is in aerial photography that you can find satisfaction in, which may be like me or may be different. So Tony, what are some of your favourite projects and have you got something new coming up? Well, probably my favourite projects would have to revolve around, number one, the ND5 team, which involves yourself, Peter, Christian Fletcher, Les Walkling and Michael Fletcher, where we've done seven or eight trips to different parts of Australia and overseas. So that's a collaborative, isn't it, where there are a group of us all photographing the same thing at the same and time. And finding different things as well. And that's the beauty of it. So working together, bouncing off each other, is a really good way to pursue your solo pursuit, but at the same time share it with the others who have a similar passion. Girt by Sea was a massive project which I completed recently with uh, another photographer. And that involved flying all the way around Australia, is that right? It did. It was started with a little dream about what does Girt by Sea mean? And uh, going out and visually showing that and sharing that adventure with Dennis Glennon and a couple of fantastic pilots. Going forwards, more travelling around the coast or inland, what are you planning? I find that I've still got 
unfinished business when it comes to witnessing the dance between the water and the light. You know, moving into Salt Lakes, which a lot of people are doing, but finding my own niche in that area. And also travel photography, I find now I'm getting asked more and more. And probably the third thing that I'm looking forward to growing as I go forward is the coaching in um, small groups or single groups. So I really love your aerial shots and I'm hoping later in the program we can convince you to show us a few of your tips and tricks. It's my pleasure, I'm looking forward to it. I need a few, that'd be great. <laughs> Back in the early 90s, I had a calendar of Patagonia. That was on the front cover. I was just so stunned by the imagery that I saved up and bought my first proper camera. And basically over 30 years, it's been a sort of a bit of a dream to come here. And finally, here we are, marvelous. So another early sunrise here in beautiful Patagonia. I can't stress enough how important it is to come to a place like this, wake up early, get down, find a spot that is special. And here we've got beautiful reflections. We've got the Piney Mountains in the background. I can't wait to take some more photos. So I've been really enjoying using my Panasonic to take my serious photography, but something I do enjoy is a smartphone. So I've used my smartphone to do some panoramas. I've also used it for group photos. Yes, you've got a mirrorless or a DSLR to take your serious photos, but your smartphone can do a great job also. We've got a unique opportunity to take photos here. So these are horses that work in the park. They do some horse trekking and that sort of thing sometimes. The rangers also use the horses. I'm always looking for special, unique opportunities where we can get photographs that you just can't generally get. And right now I can see a photograph here. I'm going to take it quickly where we've got horses with piney in the background. So I'm not doing anything special, aperture priority, F11, F8, aiming though to get a balance of the horses in the foreground with the mountains in the background. It's really stunning. Wow, I just had one of life's great experiences. We were just up top of a lookout and we're just walking down a boardwalk. As a group, we're sort of all on our way back down the hill and I was just a little bit in front and out walked out of, you know, a puma. <laughs> As the group was coming around the corner, I sort of was like trying to keep quiet. I was pointing and just trying to, you know, say there's a puma in that direction. No one believed him. And we thought, oh, he's joking. He has to be joking. Here, sure enough, within three metres, there was a puma. Eventually, she sort of popped her head out and we saw her face. It was like a little bit of confusion and silent screams. <laughs> We all just went into panic mode to take photos, get the right position. And we got some stunning photographs. And not only that, really importantly, a great life experience. So 18 trips, never ever happened before. Once in a lifetime experience, for sure. So we're out on the Patagonia Pampa Plains and we've stopped at an Estancia. I just find this a really nice experience to be with some local people. But photographically, it opens up unique opportunities. So in this case, uh, we've got a gaucho with an asado. So it's a traditional lamb barbecue and we're looking at different angles. So I'm actually shooting with a, a GP, a general purpose lens, and I'm gonna do some wide angle photographs to tell the story right through to nice portraiture of the gaucho himself. So for over a hundred years, gauchos or, or cowboys or ringers in Australia, they've been working the land here. And with their dogs, they round up sheep. Really, it's an opportunistic photographic situation. So while I mention aperture priority quite a lot, I do use other modes as well. One of them shutter priority. So in this case, we've got the gaucho actually organising the sheep to go around in a particular way and get a circular type motion occurring. So for that, we suggested go shutter priority, 60th of a second, something around that, and then look at some blur action photographs as well. So by using shutter priority, you're in control of what the shutter speed is, let the aperture do its own thing, drop your ISO down, have a go, you'll love it. So something I love our groups to do is walk with guanacos. 30 years ago, this is impossible. Guanacos were very scared of humans, but today in this modern era where a few more tourists have come through, we've helped the animals to be desensitized a little bit and realize that humans aren't going to kill them, eat them, or all those sort of bad things. So with this opportunity, um, we're doing mixed lenses. So we're looking at portraits and then the wider scene. I've actually been using a bit of a, a standard lens, so my, my GP lens, that is allowing me to actually get up reasonably close to the animals. They're not scared of us at all and get a lovely story image of guanacos with beautiful mountains in the background. 
Another consideration when you're dealing with animals, quality time. So landscapes, you do that quite naturally. But a lot of people who struggle to get good nature images, it's often because they don't spend the time. So here we're spending over an hour with these guanacos. They're very used to people and the quality time will allow you to get the full story. It's really wonderful to be here and to be seeing it with my own eyes and to be able to produce my own pictures with that same quality that I had in that calendar all those 30 years ago now. One of the challenges we have as portrait photographers is getting the light right. Professional photographers know that in a studio or using reflectors and fill lights, that's how you get the light to really make a subject sparkle. However, what do you do when you're out in the middle of nowhere, where you've got the harsh sunlight streaming down on your subject? What are our options? If we photograph with the sun behind us, our subject squints as they look into our camera. It's too harsh. We come around to the side and there's harsh shadows going across the face. That doesn't work either. So sometimes the best way is to get your subject to have their back to the sun and you look almost into the sun and shoot them that way. The background might be a little bit light, but it works out later on. Let's get back to the homestead now. So we're back down the hill. Let's see how those portraits of Tony went. The first one we've got is where he's looking straight into the sun. So the sun's behind us and look, he's squinting. A couple of things that I try is I like to look at the contrast or I may reduce the contrast down a little bit and then readjust the exposure to match. But nothing is ever going to fix that squinty look that he's got in his eyes. When it comes to side lighting, there's not a lot that we can do for that either. But the idea is to try and equalise the highlight and the shadow out. So what we would do is we perhaps look at our highlights and we darken those down a little bit and we look at our shadows and we'd lighten those up and then go back to your exposure and adjust overall. With a little bit of luck, you've got a more even distribution of tone across the face. So how do we go with our backlighting? When you look at the light that's falling on Tony, he's in shade. So he's being illuminated by the skylight or the clouds behind. There are two ways that we can process the file. The easiest one is just to say we want Tony's skin tones to look natural, so we just lighten up the skin tones until they do. So we just come over to our exposure slider, lighten them up, and we say, yep, that looks pretty good. Of course, the background is also much lighter now. In Lightroom, we could go and grab the highlights and just drop those down a little bit, and that will put a little bit more detail back into Tony's hair. The other way of processing is to darken down the image overall because we know that we're going to selectively lighten Tony's face later. And that's the next step. Choose the adjustment brush, change the exposure, just lighten it up a little bit, paint in over Tony's face. Now you have to be careful, obviously, not to go too far outside, you know, a little bit like colouring by numbers. We can then re-experiment with the exposure, maybe lighten it up, darken it down, just creating something that you think looks appropriate. But two different ways of working. Tough lighting, difficult conditions, mastered in Adobe Lightroom later on. I'm Peter Eastway. Photography is all about capture and post-production. I'm in beautiful Western Australia at Ultimate Creative Week, and I've been very fortunate to field test the new Lumix S1R. I've really enjoyed it, and I'm gonna show you some results and some top tips for this camera. My first impressions with this camera has got great ergonomics. It fits in the hand really well, and with my left hand to balance the camera, I feel very comfortable with it. It's a bit like a DSLR. Size-wise, is a little larger than your traditional smaller mirrorless cameras, but saying that, I love the feel and the balance of it, and the weight is really, really nice. Oh, I love it. Something I found early with mirrorless cameras was looking through the viewfinder. I just didn't like the look and generally not a large screen. But this camera is beautiful. It's made for professional photographers, but also high-end enthusiasts would love it. Very, very sharp screen, very good contrast, and I, I feel I can see the sharpness and the detail of every aspect of what I'm trying to create. One of the features I love about mirrorless cameras is the flip screen, and the Lumix has got a beautiful high resolution screen. So it's really nice in high bright light conditions, and also just for finer detail. And of course being touch screen for focusing, it's really those are features that make mirrorless work really well. 
This camera also has an amazing ability to be handheld down to very slow shutter speeds. So it's based on a five axis system for stabilization. It can be handheld down to five and a half stops and with the correct balanced lens to the system, you can actually also go down to six stops. Now, can you imagine taking photographs at half a second, quarter of a second, that sort of thing, and the ability to get unusual angles to get great results, so creative. I love that feature. I put some of the files into Adobe Lightroom and really enjoyed the exquisite detail that was available. The dynamic range of information from the 47 megapixel sensor is quite beautiful. So I was shooting a sand dune in low light and the ability to bring out the detail, the ripples in the sand was really outstanding. This is the first full frame mirrorless camera to offer 4K at 60 frames a second. That's a pretty handy feature if you're into videography. And then what I love about this camera is the five axis image stabilization. It does an incredible job for handheld video work. I'm not a great videographer. This makes me look very professional. Another great feature of this camera is it offers a high resolution mode. So by doing some pixel shifting, it can actually produce a 187 megapixel file. That's a massive file, a massive amount of information. And for some commercial photographers and landscape photographers, a very cool feature. I really enjoyed using this camera in the field. It's so well balanced, it's got fantastic features. I can't wait to get out and start shooting with it again. Good morning, it's a cold morning here at Middlehurst and we're about to go up in our helicopter. Our pilot Willie got here a little while ago and the first thing we had to do was have a chat about safety because that is the priority when it comes to aerial photography, particularly with helicopters because we've got the doors off today as you can see, we've taken those doors off and we don't want anything flying out of that helicopter and hitting the tail rotor because the helicopter doesn't fly too well without it. We can't take lots of camera bags so simply using one camera with a standard lens or two cameras with a variety of lenses so you don't change lenses midstream or midair so to speak is always a good way to go as well. I think it's time to go for a fly so I'll get my pilot and get my buddies and we're off. When you're in the air, settings are really important. If you get too low a shutter speed, for instance, you're going to end up with all blurry pictures. You'll have a great time, I guarantee it, but those pictures may not be something you want to share with other people. So generally, I work around the 2,000th of a second or faster. And also, because you're shooting from the air, a lot of the time you don't need big depths of field. And when it comes to the height that you fly at, around 2,000 feet is a good starting point. And then once you get comfortable, you might start looking at 1,500 feet or even lower to get some more detail. And of course, you don't have a tripod, but you've got a plane or a helicopter, they can go as high or as low as you need them to go, within reason, of course. Now, when we're in the air and we're looking down, we've got two options. We can do the look down view, and we might require the plane to tip the wings and do a very tight orbit. Or you might be in the helicopter, same thing. But you've also got the oblique view. So when you're shooting from the air, it's important to keep your awareness around both. Sometimes the patterns on the ground are what mesmerise and capture your attention. But then take a look up because often you'll be looking across a, a range of mountains or a range of hills or perhaps a river running into the distance and the side light will make for a beautiful oblique perspective which will be something that can complement your look down shots as well. One of the advantages of a helicopter is it can put you into places that are just too difficult to get to any other way. Here we are standing up on the top of the Inner Kaiakoura Range. Helicopter's just dropped us off and he's headed off to find some more spots for us. So we're gonna have half an hour up here and this is a place we could not have got to in any other way. It's cold, but it's dramatic, it's beautiful. And as you can see behind me, what an incredible landscape to have the opportunity to photograph. But we gotta keep moving so we stay warm. Being up here, the snow's super, super fresh and the light's coming in from about my 3 o'clock or 2.30 position. So it's coming in across all of these little soft mounds across the snow, just starting to glisten as the sun hits them and they begin to melt. We've got a lovely little drop off here and on the other side of that, I have another sort of uh, side of the mountain coming down, and a big dark shape in the background and this soft pastel sky behind all that. The sun's just popping out now, so without my hood on, which I took out because I was uh, doing aerial, I'm just going to block that sun and make sure I don't get any flare. That looks beautiful. 
Middlehurst, we tend to do flights from early in the morning looking at the rivers, the riverbeds, the yards where we get long shadows from fences, long shadows from trees. And then as the light comes up and starts to penetrate into those canyons, we get up into the mountain ranges and get some beautiful shots. V grooves coming in, white snow on one side, maybe no snow on the other where it's melted, etc. Uh, the other thing is when you're looking down on the ground with a plan view, everything's at the same distance. When you're looking at a mountain, it might be going past extremely quickly. If you're in a helicopter, for instance, it might only be four or five hundred feet away. Shutter speeds have to go up even higher than two thousandths of a second. You might be looking at fours and eight thousandths of a second because of the speed in which the ground or the mountainside's going past you. Now, of course, the most important factor when it comes to aerial photography, in my opinion, is the relationship with the pilot and the safety around the aircraft. So it's that little uh, yellow ring in front of you on the nose now, Willie. Right in front of you, it's one o'clock now. Four o'clock. Come around on that, that'd be great. So just down the bottom. So let's go and have a chat to one of the best pilots I've ever flown with, Willie Sage. When people are coming up and to do aerial photography and hopping into one of the aircraft, what are some of the important safety factors they should be in, keeping in mind? I think one of the most important things is just to take your time, don't do things in too much of a hurry. When you've got the doors off, you've got to be aware of anything coming out of the helicopter or the aeroplane, so that's really important to make sure any loose clothing's all tucked away and you've got lens caps and bags and things that can come out. Somebody going out there doing their first aerial flight in a, who knows, some other country in the world, hires a helicopter or a plane, What's something they could keep in mind when they first meet that pilot to, to make sure they can get the most out of the experience? Well, I think if you've got a good relationship with that guy and you sit down before you go, from a flying point of view, it's not that hard because you say, you know, fly straight ahead, I want you to turn 45 degrees to the right. Can you bank over now? I mean, it's not that tricky to do. So there you go, that's aerial photography. Work closely with your pilot, safety first at all times. Take your time, great tip from Willie that one. And um, most important thing is go up there and have fun. Thanks for joining us on Snap Happy. If you'd like to join our community, head on over to snaphappytv.com. There you'll find exclusive content, competitions and special offers from our partners. See you next time on Snap Happy, the photography show.